Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I thought I might just make a, a brief statement and then, uh, of course, would be happy to answer your, your questions. Um, I guess I'd begin with one very brief observation. I'm so glad that I live in California, uh, certainly as a Democrat, because it was obviously a difficult night for Democrats across, uh, across the country. But in California, I think the voters sent a different message. The voters, I think, said to us, they don't want to engage in the divisive Tea Party kind of politics. They want us to govern in a way that addresses their lives. For too often in politics, you know, uh, it's about the politicians when the truth of the matter is it's about the people. They elected Jerry Brown, and they kept very strong majorities uh, in both houses of the legislature. And in electing Jerry Brown, I think they said, we want a steady hand, we want someone with experience, and we want somebody with the intellectual depth to be able to work to help tackle California's complex problems. <clears throat> they certainly did not reject government out of hand. I think they said what is common sense, that for our economy to grow, we need both a healthy public sector and a healthy private sector. They said, let's get the budget done on time. And certainly, uh, there's no reason uh, for a late budget, uh, again, with the passage of Proposition 25. Unfortunately, they also lessened uh, the tools that we have certainly on the revenue side with the passage of Prop 22 and Prop 26. But I do want to put what occurred here in California again in some context as it relates to the state legislature. At least six state legislatures saw both houses switch from Democratic to Republican control. Arizona, Maine, Minnesota, New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Wisconsin. At least seven other states saw one of their houses switch to a Republican majority, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Montana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. As of the last count, 40 state, 42 states saw Democrats lose seats in their state legislatures, and that number is likely to climb. It makes the results in California even more astounding. Uh, in the Senate here, we held our 25-seat majority and uh, very happy that we uh, were able to hold in a very strong fashion our seat in uh, SD 34 with Lou Correa and to be able to hold our seat in the Valley where Jim Costa is still in a neck and neck race for his congressional seat with a resounding victory by Michael Rubio. And of course the tragic circumstances of, our, of my dear friend and our colleague uh, Jenny Orpez's passing 10 days before uh, the election required us to invest some resources in that district as well, and uh, Jenny won her last election. And now there will be a special election, of course, for her seat, and that will remain uh, in Democratic hands. And so um, I wake up this morning um, really excited about a fresh start and uh, the ability to work with a governor of my own party uh, the passage of Proposition 25, and the opportunity to help rebuild an economy in California, a better economy in California. And finally, I think it is noteworthy that the voters uh, absolutely rejected Proposition 23. And I think the signal there uh, is very clear. Uh, no more false choices between improving the environment and improving our economy. And I hope that Governor-elect Brown, I certainly look forward to working with him and the Speaker and the Republicans on California taking the next steps in leading the nation and leading the world in, in job creation around new, clean industries. That's our opportunity and that is <clears throat> our obligation here in California. We don't have the choice to choose between the two, 
We must have vote, both. That's what the voters want. And let us use uh, our infrastructure dollars. Let's, our, let's use our, our tax system. And let's use wherever we have the ability to engage in, in direct investment in doing everything we can uh, to create clean jobs and encourage clean industries here in California. I think we have tremendous opportunity. Happy to answer your questions. Darrell, can I ask you about Prop 25 yeah. in particular, um, because as you said, you're pleased with its passage. Yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, talk, talk in the microphone if you would when you answer. But um, sure. there are Republicans who are saying today, you own the budget now. Democrats own the budget. And at the same time, the voters also told you it's harder to raise fees, it's harder to move money around between local and state. There, there, there would seem to be a sense of pressure. This is your budget now. The conventional wisdom, of course, is that Proposition 25 will uh, force the Republicans to stay even further away from the process, and that that somehow is our desire. And I called Senator Dutton this morning and expressed to him uh, that my view is exactly the opposite that we need the Republican Party to participate in governing this state in a more, and I hope in a more constructive way than what has occurred over uh, the last number of years because with the two-thirds vote, we've seen what happens. There is the annual leverage dance. There is the annual late budget frustration, this year 100 days, of course. And certainly the one thing that Prop 25 should <clears throat> guarantee, or at least come close to guaranteeing, I would say guarantee, is an on-time budget in California. But we will not be able to truly balance the budget in a way that maintains both a healthy public sector and a healthy private sector without their help. So I know politically it appears that, okay, it is a big win. I'm very glad uh, that Prop 25 passed because I think it will reduce the leverage and ensure that the budget gets done on time. But we need the Republicans uh, to engage in the compromises that are going to be necessary, especially given that we are still dealing with a budget deficit. I hope they take that posture and that attitude. It's, it, it is frankly the wrong posture to say, now you own it. Each senator represents a million people. We all own it. And certainly uh, I'm going to continue to reach across the aisle and act in a bipartisan way to engage the Republicans, I know that Governor-elect Brown uh, will do the same because we can't do it alone. So can you say that once again because I want to make sure I get it right? Yeah. And then I save it for next July 1st. Are you guaranteeing an on-time budget? Uh, there is no reason. There is absolutely no reason why the budget should be late. There's no reason for it now. The budgets have been late in large part because of the two-thirds supermajority vote and, and the fact that, you know, the Republicans have, ha, have used that two-thirds to leverage and, and leverage in ways that have often made our fiscal situation worse. And now uh, it's true that uh, the majority party is ultimately accountable. We will have the ability to pass a budget on time. I hope... And, you know, my message here today is that that ought to be done on time with the cooperation of our Republican colleagues and with the necessary compromises that go with, with having different points of view on how to get it done. But it'll get done on time. Sir, isn't there a pretty given what happened in Prop 26 and Prop 22, that's going to mean a supermajority vote. I, I, a lot of what needs to be done will still require a two-thirds supermajority vote, including what the governor-elect has talked about, the potential of putting 
some clear choices on the ballot for the voters to consider. But in the end, we will have the opportunity with Proposition 25 to pass a budget on time. And the more cooperation we get from the other side, the more we can deal with the long-term structural problems within uh, our budget. And, and, uh, and yet, this on-time issue, you know, it, it, it is such a symbol of the dysfunction here in Sacramento that I think it is incumbent upon us to get it done on time. And as the governor-elect said, we don't have to even wait till the May revise. Uh, if you remember, two years ago, we passed a February budget, whereas those were extreme circumstances. But I like the fact that he has signaled very clearly that he wants to get started right away. And especially if the number is big again, we're not going to get down to June 15th and, and begin negotiating. We're going we're gonna to do it much earlier this time, I think with the help of the governor. Senator, walk us through, but aren't you also, beyond these initiatives, these measures here, you have the problem of the 1A taxes gradually phasing out, a revenue problem there. You also have 24 where the tax credits are going to start gradually being worked in. I mean, you have a serious revenue problem. Isn't this just going to make the budget crisis deepen and more troublesome to pass? The, the budget deficit uh, is the budget deficit. The problem is the problem. We're going to have to solve it. We'll either solve it with our Republican colleagues or we'll solve it without them. It will be much easier, much better, we can achieve more significant long-term solutions if we do it with them. And we want to, and my message is, we need you, come on in. But if they're unwilling to engage, which I don't expect, we have at least the opportunity to pass a budget year to year, year to year with a majority vote. Up, yeah. Wouldn't it be a cut only budget if they're not going to give you new revenues? It sounds to me like you're going to be trapped with a cuts only budget with the, with this requirement of the fees. And I, you know, I'm not Mike. I'm not going to predict uh, what is going to happen uh, come June 15th because I expect that they'll engage. I, I think the psychology, I think the psychology here changes. I know what some of the pundits are saying. Uh, and some of the Republicans are saying about, well, now you own it. But I think the psychology changes a little bit because why would you want to be on the outside looking in? I think you want to be on the inside and you want to be part of, uh, of helping to govern this state. And, you know, we have 25 Democrats. The two-thirds, you know, uh, marker is, is still, you know, uh, it's still 27. And I'm confident we're going to be able to engage Republicans. We have to. And the governor will, too. And we will, and we will not. You know, this last year, frankly, Governor, you know, I, I've been critical, publicly critical, of, of Governor Schwarzenegger here. I don't think he engaged in a real budget discussion, a real budget negotiation until September the 2nd. Really, it was September the 2nd. We got done on August the 31st, and on September 2nd, the, the negotiation got serious. It's not going to happen this time. It's going to be much earlier. In your time that you've been in the legislature, yeah. do you see anything that's more significant in the budget procedure than um, Prop 25, or is this the most significant change we've made in the procedure? I think it's a game changer. It is, um, it, it is very significant, even with the fact that the voters you know, gave with one hand and took from the other with, with Props 26 and Prop 22. Um, I still think it is a significant change because the symbol of these endlessly late budgets, the fact that so many people get hurt uh, by these endlessly late budgets is just something that um, the people are sick and tired of. We're all sick and tired of it. And Prop 25 gives us a real opportunity to change that. But 
your 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 points are well taken given the fact that we still live within uh, a very difficult economic and deficit situation whether it's fees uh, or uh, or other revenues we're going to need our republican colleagues but we'll start early and we'll get the budget done uh, we'll get the budget done on time there's so many opportunities here i mean i look at prop 22 for example which i strongly opposed the local government initiative is going to blow another billion to two billion dollars of deficit uh, in our budget. What a grand opportunity to once again talk about bringing services closer to the people, about realignment, devolution. We, we refer to it uh, by a lot of different names. But <clears throat> the premise that the state government itself is too big and trying to be too, you know, trying to do too much. I think is correct. I think we're horribly misaligned here, and local governments want, you know, more of more of the revenue, more of the resources, and they ought to take more of the responsibilities too. And uh, that's an agenda and an issue that I tend to uh, that I intend to pursue very aggressively. And you know, Governor-elect Brown in his ads, you know, one of the things I thought was rather striking was his talk uh, as a candidate about bringing services closer to the people. Let's do it. Let's untangle this mess. So, so it sounds like you're telling cities and counties to be careful what you wish for, that if since they got 22 passed, that you're going to dump a whole bunch more responsibilities, transit and highway and other things onto them now that they're going to protect their money. Is that correct? Well, I certainly wouldn't put it that way, Michael, but... Uh, <laughs> But no, I, you know, I, I, look at it, it's, uh, y you know, I always want to be gracious, but I, I've been very clear, uh, I think, over time, especially with the cities, you know, the League of Cities, this old argument that the state is doing X, Y, and Z to us is old and it's tired. Kevin Johnson's the mayor of Sacramento. We have the same constituents, and they care about police and fire service, but they're also sending their kids to the public schools and to the community colleges. And they know people who need health care. And it, it is old and tired to continue to point the finger. We are all part of this broken system together. We ought to fix it together. And certainly one of the principles that underlie a, a real fix for California is to realign. We know the state collects most of the money and we pass 75% of the money onto cities, counties, and school districts. And now with Prop 22, they're going to have a little bit more money. And the time is ripe for a discussion about how we make the state government smaller, how we maintain the level of services that people want, need, and demand, but how we do it in a more efficient way, and, and how we bring as many of those services as possible closer to the people. And uh, I think there's a great opportunity this year to begin tackling that structural reform. It's not as sexy as Prop 25 or, uh, uh, you know, some of the political reform we've debated, but you think about it, since 1978, the passage of Proposition 13, what really has happened in California is that the power has evolved or gone up to the state, and yet the locals maintain a lot of the responsibility to provide the services. It's just no wonder people are frustrated. They don't know who to hold accountable. Is it the state that is collecting all the money and, and can't, and, and can't um, do right by every cause or every service? Or is it the locals who are responsible for providing the service but don't have any ability to raise revenue? So it's among the most important things we can do. Where do yep. schools fit in? Well, 
you know, we did pretty well this year uh, by the public schools, even with a $19 billion deficit. And <clears throat> I think schools will continue to be a high priority. Look at if we are going to, if we are going to rebuild this economy, if we are going to invest in job creation along the lines of green energy, then we are going to have to invest in science and math and career education and link high school education to community colleges, to higher education, to the high wage workforce. So I think schools will do fine because I certainly think that there is a public sentiment to invest in education. I'll say another thing about education. I think the reform debate in this state needs to change. I think that's a tired conversation. Are we gonna just continue to talk about charter schools versus non-charter schools? Um, <clears throat> and you know, who's, who's right along you know, that political divide? How about we look at how we are delivering public education in the first place? Why aren't we creating multiple career pathways for high school students to help students find a path to higher education, job training, and a high wage job? <clears throat> Why aren't we teaching algebra, geometry, and sciences in 10 different applied ways towards different career opportunities? That's the education debate here in California. Not, not the same tired debate we're having that divides the unions and, and, and the other side. I think with Jerry Brown in office that there's going to be an opportunity to have those kinds of, those kinds of discussions um, that might actually help kids. So the, the effort to, to kill the redistricting commission failed and to block the expansion of it. Yeah. Um, it looked like the, those efforts fizzled some time ago. Did you see the writing on the wall? Yeah, I did. And, I did. And how do, what effect do you think it's going to have on the legislature? Do you think we'll have a moderating effect with other reforms like the open primary? Well, I think the open primary is very significant um, in terms of hopefully creating uh, some more, you know, the way I look at it, some more Republicans who um, are open to a balanced approach to solving the state's fiscal crisis. I, I think the redistricting issues remains to be seen because nobody knows what the independent commission is going to do. We don't, uh, we don't even know yet who the members of the commission are going to be. But I think the voters spoke loud and clear um, on that issue. And, you know, uh, we're going to have enough uh, to, to tackle over the next several years, um, you know, and uh, while I would have liked the opportunity to have led uh, a fair redistricting process, certainly um, get where the voters get where the voters are coming what are from. Your three biggest priorities for next session. Three biggest priorities. Number one, um, forge a positive agenda around job creation and clean industry. Second, reform public education, but in a, but in a different way than the way the debate has been framed uh, these past several years in a way I just described a few moments ago. And three, to continue uh, to work on making uh, better California's fiscal system and to help get us out of this fiscal crisis as quickly as possible. Go. Got many more. On the third one, just really quickly, yeah. can you help me do the math? Make sure we've got the math right. So you said you believe Prop 22 blows a one to two billion. One to two billion dollar hole. Prop 26 also undoes your gas tax swap. Arguably, so, I think that'll end up in court. But, but that would yeah. be what a billion dollars. That would be about a billion dollars, right? And so we were already looking at a ten billion dollar problem for next year, right? So could I say potentially twelve to thirteen? No, am I doing the math wrong? It's the same. It's the same. Twenty two and twenty six yeah. are the same. Yeah. Good try. Government math. Yeah. So, but, 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 so, right, but, we're, but we're looking at potentially, do you think 12 to 
12 billion is a possible number? I mean, have you told the governor elect anything yet? Do you intend to when he comes up? But here's what I think the number is. We, uh, we're going to have better numbers uh, today. I know that Craig Cornett, a finance director, is meeting with the LAO. We want to get a very early assessment of what the number is. It wouldn't surprise me uh, to see a number uh, of that magnitude. It wouldn't surprise me. You know what? We've tackled, <laughs> let me tell you, I mean, the two years, these, the, these two years uh, have been valuable in many ways. Um, not necessarily enjoyable, but valuable. Um, we've gotten through worse. <laughs> we got through $60 billion year one. We just finished $19 billion, and it's true, it's, some of it's based on, you know, uh, ambitious assumptions around federal funding. We all know that. But if it's $12 billion, and I hope it isn't, we'll, we'll deal with it. And we'll deal with it in part, I want to reiterate, by beginning to restructure and realign this government. The state cannot do cannot do everything anymore, and yet the services are important, and we need to redefine our relationship with uh, local governments and school yeah, districts. We another $10 billion to the federal government for uh, unemployment insurance uh, loans. And how do you that? Well, that's another issue we're going to have to tackle very early on. We know uh, what the options are. You know, uh, there's the benefit side, and, and there is the... Uh, and there is the fee side on employers, and I think we're going to have to look at both of them. Senator, I yeah, that, why? Uh, earlier, sort of going back to ballot propositions, that sort of like one hand the voters gave, on the other they took away. Right. I'm wondering what you think, what you think the message was from voters. Was there a clear message? Was it a mixed message? Um, I, 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 I think it's a mixed message. <clears throat> I, I think... Um, they're tired of the late budgets, and uh, thus Prop 25. I think they are also hurting economically. And it's not just Prop 26, but it was Prop 21 as well, the Parks Initiative, where they said, not now, not now. Okay, I think, I think we need to hear that. I think we need to heed that. Um, on the other hand, Californians, I think, and I think Governor-elect Brown will help lead this debate, do need to confront, just as we all need to confront, the choices that are available out there. I said this many years ago, and I'll repeat it again. What do we want, and how do we go about paying for what we say we want? That was the question five years ago, and it remains the question today. Because that imbalance, um, that imbalance must be confronted, not just, not just in terms of resolving the budget year to year, but, but the people need to decide, uh, and its elected representatives need to decide what kind of investment do we want to make in public education? And how do we want to change what we know isn't working? Do we want the ability to, to keep our, our roadways safe? If we want greater criminal penalties for people who commit violent crimes, are we willing to pay the cost of incarceration? You know, we can go through every Every, every part of the government, but I think Governor Brown, Governor Lick Brown, is uniquely suited, given his temperament, given his experience, to ask that question and to help us over time answer it. What do we want? And how do we go about paying for it in the most efficient way possible? first time that I can recall that voters actually turned down something on the ballot related to parks. They seem to have decided. 
yet you always circle back to revenues. Are there tax increases that you think the voters will accept? I, I don't think today I've, you know, come right on out and, you know, uh, and emphasize revenues. Um, we, emphasize, we, at it, I hint at it. Yeah. Well, I, because I know, depending on what the deficit is, there are two ways to close it. Really. Uh, that is to cut or to find some ways to raise revenue. And then I suggested today that there is a third way, which is to engage in the hard work of restructuring the way this government operates. <clears throat> and, and I start as the number one way to do that is to re-examine the relationship between the state and other levels of government. Yeah. Well, I think it's going to be much more difficult to uh, consider a count on an additional stimulus package. I don't think that's likely to happen, unless it's around infrastructure. Unless it's around infrastructure, which I think you know is another issue which crosses the partisan divide. But obviously, um, you know, the states have received significant uh, assistance. We've had a significant partnership with the federal government over the last two years, and God knows where we would be without that, given the magnitude of the deficits. But I don't think we can expect that to continue in the next, uh, in the next two years. On the other hand, there may be some opportunities like infrastructure where we can partner again with the federal government and, and help us uh, rebuild this economy. Senator. Yes. Given the fact that um, California's already rejected several of the mediation petitions, would they extend it as part of it? And then we saw John Boehner trying to do that for some of the Do you think that goes poorly for Democrats in California and is it at all reflective of the shift right that we saw in the administration? Not necessarily. I mean, it's still a Democratic state here in California. No matter how you divide the lines, it's a Democratic state. Barbara Boxer, elected for her fourth term, one of the more liberal senators in the country. Jerry Brown. I mean, California beat back the red wave in the most significant way. Look at this. We won, if Kamala Harris holds on, every statewide race. We maintained or increased our legislative majorities. The voters did pass Prop 25 to give the majority party the uh, ability to pass, uh, to pass the budget. And so whoever draws the lines, this is still a fundamentally democratic state. I think it will remain so. What would life be like in Sacramento without a mid-year budget session? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's probably likely that there'll be a mid-year budget session. Whether or not there is a special election, I think that remains to be seen. I know that uh, the governor-elect has talked about it. I think it's an intriguing idea, but I think it's too early, really, to, to, to determine and decide whether or not that is the best path. Hopefully, we can uh, work together and work across party lines early in the year and to come to some common, common principles and common approaches to how we want to deal with the numbers uh, that, that confront us. Um, that could involve an election. <clears throat> Certainly to do anything to change the Constitution requires uh, going back to the people. But my view, it's too early to say whether or not we ought to go to the ballot in, in May or June. It's certainly a, you know, an intriguing, intriguing idea. Yes? Well, let me ask my wife to answer that question. Uh, I, I don't like that provision um, because I do think it creates the I, I, I do think it creates the the possibility that you uh, that you speak of, David. 
On the other hand, given the fact that the majority can now pass a budget, I'm not that worried about it. Well, uh, I congratulate Tom Torlakson. He's happy to endorse him in, uh, in the general election. I think that, um, you know, that'll be a very important discussion with the governor-elect in terms of uh, his appointments, and certainly the Senate has the power of confirmation. And I I'm interested in seeing people who, you know, are not ideological uh, and who recognize that that fixing public education um, you know is not just uh, is not an easy thing and that uh, we got to get beyond some of the you know the debate the 30,000 foot debate that goes on here now and figure out how we you know like I say create a pathway that's the create a pathway for every kid to move on to something, to something good in their lives. Do you think local schools are fixing to get more power with local restructuring and changing the system? Well, I don't know if they're fixing to get more power. I do know that, you know, the local control issue that I've spoken about here today and spoke about a lot last year also does have to be tempered a little bit. The state has a role. Certainly, they have, we have a constitutional role, Serrano v. Priest, to make sure that funding is equalized and that um, we take we're cognizant of the fact that different communities have different tax bases and and funding bases um, so I don't know if it's a matter of power or control with the locals I just think our government is horribly misaligned we take the money we we raise the money and we pass it down and they have very little ability to set local priorities or, or to affect the revenue side of the equation. I think that fundamentally needs to change. We can shrink the size of state government, provide the same level of public investment, but have a lot of it closer to the people. I think that would resonate with the people of California. All right. Thank you.